Welcome back to season three of ASD Market Week's podcast, Let's Talk a Little Shop, with your host, me, Emily Lewis. We're going to tackle the hard subjects. So buckle up and get ready for season three. We're going to have a lot of fun. Welcome everyone to ASD's podcast, Let's Talk a Little Shop. We are launching season three today, and I could not be more excited to have our first guest for season three, David Levitch, who is the co-founder and co-owner of an amazing brand called Sunstashes. Now, David, I'm so excited that you were brave enough to say you'll be our first guest for season three. So thank you. <laughs> well, Emily, thank you for having me on. I very much appreciate it. I'm excited and I'm honored to be your first guest for season three. So thank you so much. Um, can you tell our audience, give us your best elevator pitch. What well, we are, our Sunstashes is a brand of glasses uh, that are actually a party on your face. Let's, let's just put it that way. It is, But we do have adult glasses. We have kids glasses. We have all different sizes and you will become, you know, whatever character you put on. So you're, it's a transformative eyewear product and you, you, could, you almost visualize it as a mask that's much easier to wear and protect your eyes from the sun so yeah. and i'm sure you've seen around i've seen it around because we you know we have most parties nowadays have a pair of sunstashes there most photo booths have part have sunstashes out there so you've probably seen them around yeah i i would love to think that all of our viewers have been to asd if they haven't they need to come but 100 percent I know that there's probably not one person out there that has not done the photo booth, photo opportunity moment at a party, a prom, a wedding. And every single time I'm in one of those photo booths, no doubt Sunstashes is there. So um, it, it's a great brand. It's a fun brand. And that really is what we're talking about today, because the theme of season three for our podcast is all about what's important. And when we were going through, you know, the relationship that ASD has had with your brand and um, what your brand represents, the first thing that came to my mind and my entire team's mind was fun. It is really just a fun brand. When you guys were building the brand, was there, you know, was there um, a motto or something that sparked the idea? Did, were you guys thinking about fun? Did you find something that was missing in the market? Tell us a little bit about how you guys started it. I mean, I'm smirking because there's a, there's a lot of mottos that we made, but most of them weren't appropriate. So, um, <laughs> but, but yes, absolutely. Our goal, uh, first of all, was to differentiate ourselves from regular sunglasses because there's everybody was selling, you know, uh, the same stuff. So we, when we started doing this, we said, how do we become different, completely different? And and that kind of was the first part. But fun is actually a byproduct, I would say. Uh, and once we realized that, we created, you know, we started going way deeper into that. So like right now, why we love giving out sun sashes at ASD? Because there's not a single person that will put it on their face and not laugh or smile. Yeah. And, and frankly, like whenever you start seeing people smiling and your joke, your booth is kind of a joke, and everyone's having a good time, you know, it's, it's always, it's it, like, it gives you energy to get through the day. And that's, and I realized that's exactly what our glasses do to kids, to adults and all over the world. So this is, this is exactly why we're so excited to keep our line actually growing very rapidly uh, throughout the world, which is really cool. I love that. And we're going to dive into some of the brand origins in a minute, but I always like to get to know I'll say in this case, the man behind the glasses. So I'd like to get to know you a little bit more on a personal level. So tell us where you grew up and a little bit about your family dynamic. Sure. Uh, my parents are medical professionals. We, I was born in Moscow. I immigrated to, to America when I was around eight years old. Uh, so I'm actually originally Russian. And, you know, I got thrown into a school that no one spoke any English. I mean, any Russian. So I, I, spoke, I picked up English pretty quickly. But after that, uh, you know, we lived in Hollywood and then we moved to the Valley and uh, my parents wanted me to be doctors and uh, that's the last thing I wanted to do. So, you know, right out of high school, uh, my friends and I started different businesses selling different things, including hip hop jewelry, which we also sold at ASD. Um, and <laughs> uh, yep. And after a while, you know, that's kind of how 
you know, that's how this whole thing developed. But that's that's my my life. I mean, that's amazing. What a journey you have had. So I imagine that being the only child that didn't speak English in an English speaking school, you you had to adapt pretty quickly. What what was your most memorable moment of that time in your life? I'll tell you the, the best the, the best moment I would think is after I went to my school the first day or like maybe the first week or something. I was nine years old, I think. I came home and I and my parents asked me how so how was how was you know, how was your first day of school or first week of school? And I told them like I feel like everybody's speaking Russian because I actually kind of felt like I understood, you know. So and and, and I mean when I came to to America, I spoke Italian also because I picked up Ita- oh, wow. Italian when I lived in Italy for for a year, um, but I don't remember it any longer. But but I but I literally felt that I, I I picked up English incredibly quickly. I was really young and I felt like everybody spoke Russian. So that's the, that's what I still remember, you know. And people were really nice to me, which is at least at least that's what I thought. So, but the people were really nice to me. So, what do you think that you feared most about you know your future or growing up at that time? <laughs> Um, the only thing I think of is actually the same thing that I fear now, which is as an adult and as a kid, because I think it's been ingrained in me as a Russian immigrant is being broke, literally being broke. Um, it is, it is something that I always feared because we were broke when you left Russia or actually at the time of the Soviet Union, you denounce your citizenship. You cannot take anything with you. You cannot sell your home. You cannot, even if you do, you can't take any money with you. You can't take anything with you. So you could take a suitcase and, and, and really, you know. So when you when we came to America and when we were in Italy we were you broke you know we had no money um, so wow. that was my fear ingrained in me uh, so I've had that fear ever since I was a child and and still do like that's kind of my drive like I just never want to be you know broke and uh, and I, I don't want my kids to experience that same feeling that I've had so I think that's that's the fear you know yeah that, yeah that drives me. I think you have a lot of people out there that that share that fear. And um, mm-hmm. I found that the most successful people that I know and have had the pleasure to, you know, um, work with or talk to in some way, shape or form, there's a there's a common um, denominator there of how they grew up and their drive and how that pushed them to be successful today. So that's that's really interesting to hear from you. Um, okay, one more fun question, and then I want to share um, the origin stories for Sunstashes. So, what's your favorite holiday? Just out of curiosity. Hmm. <laughs> um, I'm going to say Halloween. I oh, love I Halloween. love it. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, Sunstash is like a perfect product for Halloween. Uh, yes, I mean, yes. Believe it or not, it's not our top, that's not our top season where we sell goods, but it is, okay. it is a strong one. But I just feel like when something is festive and a little bit of dark it's just kind of fun and and I love I love everyone getting dressed up I think it's really cool my kids like love Halloween especially my daughter she will probably be like 15 15 different characters um this this Halloween including Wednesday which is incredibly popular and and you know and then there'll probably be more but uh I'm gonna say that Halloween is is definitely it it's so funny that you say that Halloween was is not your top um, selling season because I was actually literally on your website looking for um, some sunglasses for a costume for my 10 year old last night. So it is strong for us, especially certain items, um, mm-hmm. but it is not our top selling season. Summer, sunglass season, going to theme mm. park season is our top season for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So tell us how, you know, this kid that Im- was an immigrant from Russia with high expectations from, you know, obviously very, you know, successful in their own right, um, parents moving to Hollywood, you know, the Mecca of, you know, California and, you know, the U.S. in, in such, mm-hmm. you know, pop culture sense. Um, how did Sunstashes start? Because you guys have a very unique story that ties a little bit into Hollywood. You know, it was my partners and I from high school. So that that's okay. who started that's that's who started the company. It was, uh, currently, there's three of us, um, and we were selling hip hop jewelry, um, all the bling stuff. Like, and we were really good at it. We were doing really well. At one point, we were top like Forbes top thirty under thirty. Um, wow. You know, like all that stuff. This is and this is when we were under thirty. We're clearly not there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> not even not even under forty any longer. Not even under forty. Yeah, no, but, I, we get it. <laughs> 
So, but, but um, you know, during the t- 2008 and the Great Recession, the economy mm-hmm. started dropping pretty significantly and a lot of our customers lost their credit. Um, uh, so, what we yeah. st- so what we started looking at is how do we, you know, kind of pivot at that point to a different market. And, and the best market we saw was um, eyewear. And the reason why is because at the time there was a lot of famous products like the sun, we, the shutter shades that Kanye wore. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. A, a fun story actually is uh, my partner, Dan, we were trying to do business with Claire's because we were doing some business with them for, for jewelry. Okay. And we were trying to do business with sunglasses for, for Claire's. And they weren't interested in the shutter shades. They were just not interested. So what, what, what Dan did is he offered a buyer because he had the buyer's ear, but he offered the buyer 10,000 pairs, I believe the number was, for free, not even consignment. And said, if you don't, if you sell them, you keep the profit, if you, all the profit. And if you don't sell them, then throw them away. But if you do sell them and they are successful, buy them for me. And wow. after wow. that, we, so, we sold, I mean, millions of units uh, of, of that product to Claire's specifically. And that is such a retailers. great story. And I want to stop you really quick right there because that takes so much foresight to take that kind of risk. Do right. you feel that if you, if your partner at that point had not taken that risk, that you guys would be where you are today? Probably not because we've done after that, when we d- did develop sun sashes, which is a mustache sunglass, uh, and I'll go get back to how it was developed. Um, that was a, they were the first ones to really carry that product as well, which is Claire's because wow. we already were, because they trusted us at the time. Yeah. And, and even if it wasn't, and they were kind of, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have a chance to, to kind of make a large market out of it, you know? But, um, and so, yes, wow. I would say that was a massive, massive point in our book. You know, yeah, it was, it yeah. was, I would say that, that, that was a chapter, you know, but. Um, I've never heard absolutely. a story like that. It's really, really interesting. So I'll let you get back to how you guys started, but that sure. I've never heard someone taking, I mean, 10,000 units is, is a lot. It, I mean, and I think it was 10,000. I might be off by a couple thousand, but it was, it was not, it was, it was not even a consignment deal. It was literally yeah. sell it and, and trash it. And and I mean, the buyer, I think at the time was like, it'd be irresponsible for me not to do that. You know, like wow. the opportunities yeah. there. So, <laughs> yeah. so he was just offered we, the deal of a lifetime. <laughs> and we scrambled because we didn't even know how to manufacture them that well at the time. So like, we kind of like scrambled to get it done, you know? So it was, wow. it was, pr- it was pretty wild. Um, okay. But I'll, I'll tell you, how we started is because uh, my, we added we had, we added we had a design department. We were starting to work on sunglasses, and and uh, our our in house design team, uh, you know, we had a few designers at the time, but my, my one of our designers, Jordan, uh, came up and he's like, hey, you know, we should make something with mustaches, and he kind of developed um, an idea because like well, he lived he lived like in the area where hipsters were, and I'm like I'm, I'm like I saw my mustaches being a big thing. Jewelry was starting to have mustaches on it, things like that. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. He, he kind of designed, he kind of developed a thing where it had like, you know, uh, all plastic mustache thing um, that connected. And I'm like, hey, look, it's not going to move correctly. And we're already making jewelry. So why don't we put them on chains? And that's why our first mustache glasses had chains hanging down because we're already making jewelry. So that was how the original product was born um, and, and the brand. Um, and then after that, um, it kind of, you know, went further and further, um, you know, where, where, you know, we started making glasses, not with mustaches and all kinds of different things, but it's, you know, it's just kind of, it started off in that end. Got it. Got yeah. it. That's interesting. Um, and I did not know the backstory about the the jewelry. So that makes total sense with the chain now. I, I mm-hmm. totally get it. So right. you guys ended up on a small little show that probably, you know, nobody that's listening to this is going to know called Shark Tank. <laughs> Oh yeah, that show. Oh yeah, yeah, that. <laughs> that story. So I know there's probably some things because I know you know the, that world makes you sign you know certain NDAs and there's certain things that you can't talk about. But whatever you can tell us about your experience on Shark Tank and you know maybe what you've learned or how it changed your business. Sure, um, Shark Tank was a big deal in our lives and it was almost by mistake we got on that show and i'm gonna say almost by mistake because we were about to go to a trade show in las vegas the three of us my partner my two partners and myself and we knew we found out there was an open casting call in vegas and and we're like we're too lazy to fill out the applications and all this other stuff so my wife who at the time worked with us um she kind of said she's like 
you guys are going to this open casting call and I'll fill out your application, which is like a huge application. <laughs> so we, we got to this open casting call at the Silverton Casino in Las Vegas, um, waited in line for hours um, and got a chance to pitch to a producer for like 30 seconds over a mag megaphone that somebody was using it behind us. So like we're, but we kind of, we, we made a 25 second pitch to make it sound, you know, uh, that we're fun and we have a great product. And at the time, we really had no licensing. I think we just had Nickelodeon. We just got Nickelodeon license, and okay. we ended up we ended up uh, you know talking to the producer, and the producer told us this. He's like, he basically said to us, "Hey, look, this is a long process, but you know, so you just be ready." And we didn't know what that meant, but we felt like, "Hey, look, I think we did well enough to maybe get a phone call back." And you know, eventually we did, and okay. and and you know, now it's all history. But overall, it was pretty cool. Do you remember the pitch? No. The 20, I mean, 20, <laughs> that original one, this is this is a, a ten years ago. I mean, we aired in two thousand fourteen, season six, right? So this yeah. is the actual pitch was ten years ago in two thousand fourteen. Wow. Wow. So and you guys ended up choosing Damon John as your um, you know, shark, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So what was that like? What was there was that a I imagine now knowing your background, that was very strategic, but you know, you have, do you, and, you have to make those decisions really quick, right? Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's wild. Uh, so J Damon John shows us, let's not be like, let's not, <laughs> let's not take it back. We didn't choose, we didn't choose him. He chose us and we are very, very fortunate. He chose us because okay. at the time when we went in, you know, we obviously want to mark Cuban because Mark Cuban's a billionaire. He's the richest guy by far, more than everybody else. We think all these things. And and we're incredibly fortunate to have Damon because we've worked okay. with him for the last nine years. The guy is a stand-up human being. I mean, I've we've spent a lot of time with him. Um, he is incredibly smart. Um, he is incredibly fair. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I've said before to others, like I, you know, people talk to me about like how is it working with Damon? I'm like, he's he has contractually a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. to potentially, you know, to, to, to do a lot more and mm -hmm. take more of your company if necessary, whatever. It doesn't really matter. But the point is he never has ever done anything that's been negative to us. He's only wow. done things that uh, are advantageous to us. So uh, also he's, he knows licensing. He has incredibly good connections and he's very good at retail. He understands apparel, which is close to sunglasses, but not, but we are, yeah. you know, uh, wholeheartedly we're in we're incredibly fortunate. We're still, you know, good friends. We're, we work together. We're partners and all that. So we're, uh, we got lucky and he chose us. At the time, I believe it was the, the deal was the worst deal in the history of Shark Tank because our valuation was so bad. <laughs> so I believe that that was the case, but uh, it was absolutely, it has worked out uh, for everybody incredibly well. So we're very fortunate. What do you think the biggest lesson that you've learned from Damon has been? Oh, man, um, this is going to be a tough one, actually. <laughs> there, this is a tough one, but I'll tell you that that um, you know he he trusts um, you know he trusts a lot of people. Um, he he actually trusts people and and he lets them do their thing. He lets them run, um, okay. and 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 he lets them run until they uh, until they prove them wrong. And that's a big deal because a lot of the times we're micromanaging everything, including our team and everybody else. Um, and it kind of puts you in a place where you can't get much done. Uh, Damon doesn't, he has a lot of, you know, he has a lot of, a lot of, a big team and mm -hmm. each team, each team, team member is really responsible for their part of their business. And it's really interesting to see that. So, you know, I, I've seen that I, there's a lot of, there are a lot of lessons from Damon. Like if you really pay attention, like, uh, like ethically, uh, you know, morally, like even health wise, he was diagnosed mm -hmm. with cancer. Um, um, and he did it because he did a, a screen, a specific screening. I think it's called Prenuvo or something like that. Mm -hmm. They caught it early and wow. he had surgery. And because of that, I'm doing this, this screening too now because I saw him doing it. So I'm doing it as well. Like, so there's a lot of, there are a lot of lessons. I, you know, I kind of, I definitely follow a lot of things that he does. So that's, like that. I mean, that's, like I said, that's amazing to hear. You've seen a lot. What do you feel? is most important for a successful brand in the beginning stages of, of building and launching a company? What foundationally, what do you think is, is most important? 
I, I believe the most important part is your team. Um, really is your team because we're fortunate the majority of our team has been with us since we were selling jewelry. So, mm -hmm. you know, it is a, it's a big deal. And, and the ones that aren't, we have an incredibly, we have incredibly low turnover. Um, they're, you know, I feel that if you do, if you keep on having high turnover and, and, and everybody dislikes you or you dislike everybody and you have a negative environment, you're just not going mm -hmm. to be able to, to build a very successful business. Um, sometimes at the cost is you yourself won't make as much money, but that's okay because overall, long term, you're going to do you're going to do fine. Um, if 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 that you know, there's obviously circumstances that would be under control, like COVID and things like that. Um, but in order to build a brand, is you have to build a good team, um, and you also have to believe in your product, mm -hmm. and you cannot and and you cannot screw people over. You just yeah. cannot. You um, especially you cannot screw over your customers your employees, um, your, your, you know, um, really like your licensors in, in the space, because you, your reputation is, 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 is very important and it's a very small world. Yes. So. Yes. Yes. It is such a small world out there. So to your point, it's a really good piece of advice that you really have to be careful. Um, and you should be treating people good regardless, but absolutely. I, I think in a business, you really need to think about that. So that's that's a great piece of advice. Tell us about a time that maybe you made a decision or a decision was made and it resulted in failure. No, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> failure. Um, a, a lot of them. There have been a lot of failure. I mean, you know, there are full product lines that we've created that we spent like like during COVID. All right. Mm -hmm. We. We didn't know what to do because like our sales are down significantly. So we're like, you know, we went to license stores and asked them to make face shields because we're making sunglasses. So yeah. why don't we make face shields with license, license face shields? Um, we spent, we spent a lot of money, especially when we didn't have it. Um, mm -hmm. because we're not, we have no, we had no sales coming in and we developed a bunch of products and brought in mm -hmm. a bunch of products from the United States originally because you couldn't get much from China and eventually from China. And we lost all that money because it really sold almost nothing. So, but mm. then you had to, but then we just, you know, kind of like said, okay, scratch it off. But like we made this error. It, it didn't, it taught us that sometimes things you think are going to work is, are not going to work, uh, but mm. we move forward. And that's all it comes down to just what you just cannot dwell on these things. If you do, you're just going to keep on thinking everything fails, you know? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a good piece of advice. Everyone's going to fail and resiliency is key. So that's a really mm -hmm. um, good piece of advice. Mm -hmm. I, I think the goal is, is speed bumps, right? Try taking risks that are speed bumps. They're not brick yeah. walls. And that's, yeah. and that's the most important part. Yeah. Yeah. I always say, you know, risk are okay. Calculated risk or preferred. Um, because if you can take some calculated risk and gain some learnings on it, it can only propel you further. It, but, but to your point, yes, the brick walls, you don't, you don't want to run into those. You want the, the speed bumps, no matter how big or small. Right. Exactly. <laughs> You brought up something, um, you know, you, you talked about COVID and we know that that was a really tough time for a lot of people. What is your outlook for 2024? And, you know, what advice do you have for others in terms of how to navigate rough waters, whether they come or not? I mean, everyone has to mitigate their own risk, right? Um, but but there's a lot, there are a lot of people I know um, that during COVID, before they knew it really much of anything, you know, they just saw the business is slowing down. They fired a bunch of their people. And when, when, when they realized there are PPP options or different options, they had no, they had absolutely no chance to get those people back. And that became a very significant problem. I think like as an owner, you have to make money enough money to be able to support yourself and maybe not pay yourself for a while, but make mm -hmm. sure you keep your team paid. Right. Um, which we did during COVID um, to make sure for a certain amount of time, we wanted to make sure that we didn't make any drastic decisions where we laid off everybody or did yeah. anything like that. So we want to see what options we had. And if we're going to lose money for a certain amount of time, we don't want to kill our entire business. And that's what we kind of did. And I think that's the same thing right now. Like if look at what's present, right. And then mm -hmm. under, you could take some, you can mitigate some risk. But if you're going to make drastic decisions in anticipation of something, you have no clue because if mm -hmm. economists don't know and they can't, they can't gauge it, you can't gauge it, right? And you might be right this time, but you'll be wrong next time. So yeah. The, the, so so I think like obviously be conservative, 
but Mm -hmm. you you know and have like what what we do is we bring in more conservative product like we know during recessions typically evergreen licenses do very well because people are comfortable with them right products under ten dollars do well Mm -hmm. we are both of those things so we 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 know that our and our customers are and we tell our customers that like look guys we're gonna your our products are still gonna sell and we're Mm -hmm. we're also impulse and we're also a brick and mortar you know so all these things are right now that make sense. So we're, we absolutely um, do that, but we also understand that there, we cannot just hire everybody we want to right now. We can't fill every, you know, all, we can't yeah. fill every position. We can't take significant inventory risk. We have to minimize our inventory risk. So you just have to mitigate all that. Most people have opinions and they're very strong and they stick to them. And you're saying, I don't know. And it's okay not to know. And mm-hmm. so I would say running a business when you don't know, what are some steps that you think you can take to to mitigate those risks or plan accordingly when you really don't know? And then take some risk off the both bottom line and top line. And my opinion is like, let's say you are expecting, if, if you're really worried, you know, take some, don't bring in as much inventory for the year. That's yeah. one of the things, you know, maybe cut a few expenses that are not the most important expenses to you, but don't like, you know, don't take drastic measures preemptively. And that's what a lot of people do. You know, they see the first sign of weakness and they'll literally cause significant problems. A lot of people have destroyed their businesses by firing a ton of their best, good, expensive employees, but good employees who then afterwards, even three months later, didn't want to come back, you know, yeah. uh, because, because they got really upset about it. And they said like, you, you know, you didn't even give it a chance to figure out what's going on. And, you know, and that yeah. happened. And I know I have a lot of friends and, and people in my industry that, that like, that's one of their, that's, that's one of the biggest mistakes they've ever made in their entire business. And we've all navigated through different, like we navigated through the great recession. We changed our entire business because yeah. we saw it going, but that's because it was real time going to shit. Sorry for my language. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <You're fine. laughs> so, so, but that was real time. We were seeing this and we had to navigate out of that and change our entire business. That was a drastic decision, but we felt that yeah. that was the one that made sense, but we didn't preemptively do this, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. So it, that's, that's basically my opinion. Yeah. And I keep hearing a theme reoccur with you, which, um, you know, I, I wholeheartedly believe in, which is the importance of team and people and making sure that the people come first. Um, so, you know, I, I love that because I can't speak you know, more highly of the team that makes up ASD Market Week and the team behind the scenes that that's making, you know, that event happen twice a year. So why, talking about ASD Market Week, why did you guys choose to do trade shows? Because you get, it matters what trade, every trade show has, has a different reason. Um, mm-hmm. I'll tell you, I could tell you what ASD is uh, to us. Yeah. Uh, it's to us, ASD is completely different distribution that we currently have. And okay. it, it takes years to develop that business. It's not like you do one ASD show. Oh, okay, it was all right. Or it was not good. I'm not doing it again. It takes years and years. Um, and we have been a, a mainstay at ASD we have, uh, for many years. Um, we were selling. I, I've, I've been going to ASD since I was 18 years old. I'm over 40. <laughs> figure that one out. So I love um, that. I love that. So, I mean, I've been going there for a long time. Uh, it was hard I, to get I a whole, 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 whole. you to get some of the history of, of ASD before I was here. <laughs> ASD is, to me, it's a different distribution to order writing show. So we get mm-hmm. completely different. Uh, we also get mom and pa business there. Yeah. Um, you know, where other shows, we do those shows almost, we know we're not going to get, we're not going to write much orders or really any orders there. Uh, it's more of a PR business, you know. So. Yeah. And, and, so, and some of them are very specialized shows. So we like shows because still face-to-face is the way to do business to us. Um, mm-hmm. It's hard to do a lot of, I mean, some, some retailers prefer, especially the larger ones, prefer Zoom meetings. They don't even want to see you anymore. Um, and that's fine. But we mm-hmm. still, there's, there's a very, there's a lot of different type of distribution and businesses. And ASD has a very large variety of it. And, uh, yeah. and some of them are, are built, are, we're building to be very big, you know, for, for our sales and we're very excited about it. So, so we keep coming back. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head, especially, um, with ASD. It is about building your business. So you have to invest and it takes time, but it really is about connecting with people and trade shows and events in general, 
Um, there's just a connection that you can get at events that no matter how great the digital landscape is, no matter how many meetings you take in, you know, the metaverse, it's not the same as, you know, meeting with your customer face to face and getting, you know, that, that interaction that really helps build your business. So, um, thank you for that. And thank you for coming to ASD and supporting us because we love having you guys there, um, you know, when we were talking about this podcast, I sent you a picture, which we use all the time with ASD, which is the team's favorite picture, and it's sun stashes. Mm -hmm. Well, I know time is of the essence. Um, this has been such, you know, a great podcast to talk to you, to learn a little bit more about the brand, but so many good business insights from, you know, I think there's a lot of people out there that they might be struggling with their business. They might be trying to start or launch a business. They might be trying to scale their business. And to hear from you, to hear from someone that really built from the ground up, I, I always think, you know, is, is so inspiring because I think people always think, oh, well, that guy could do it or that woman could do it and I can't. And, you know, you're telling people, no, like I, you know, I, I came from the ground up and I built it and it took a long time. And these are some of the things that are important. So thank you for those insights. Um, uh, can I give you one, one more thing? Please what, what do. You said? Please do. This our business, our this like our original business, the sense uh, it was actually Ice Style Gear, which is our, our jewelry business. I kind of spurred mm -hmm. into this, right? Uh, eventually, I mean, um, it started with two hundred dollars. That's what it started with. There were no debt. I mean, I used credit card debt, I guess, after, for a while, but it was literally two hundred dollars. So, yeah. and and at the time, we were putting things on eBay. I mean, everything, you know, it it's, it just takes time and a lot of a lot of work. Um, and and a great team that's really what it comes down to and, and believing in your product developing something you know for a market if it doesn't exist but it started with 200 dollars. so if somebody says they can do it they could absolutely do it you know yeah um yeah yeah the landscape is changing um there is yeah. a lot of you know if you want to have brick and mortar you really have to have service base and entertain your customer base that's a big deal uh versus you know people and but if you want to go on amazon or any other these other businesses you're going to find a lot of competition and you really have to, you have to change that too. You have to entertain your customer there as well, because you have to differentiate yourself. Right. So, yeah. but anyone, but anyone could really do it. Um, it just, it just, you have to put in the work. That's what it comes yeah. down to. I want to end in, you know, a fun way. And I always, you know, I always find it interesting when I'm talking to my friends, the first things that I start to ask them are, Hey, you know, what movie did you, did you last see? What book did you last read? Um, you know, what did you eat for dinner last night? So, I'm just going to pretend like we're, you know, we're old friends that are just catching up. So tell us the last movie that you saw and did you like it or not? And why? Mm, I'm just trying to figure out what I saw. I mean, I usually only watch movies on planes. Uh, so I don't. What same, I see. Or, 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 or actually I saw Mario with my son. Or my, okay. Yeah. I saw Mario <laughs> with my son and I, and that was really good because it's very nostalgic and he didn't get a lot of it, but I got it. Yeah. So that was, I like the Mario movie, um, and we also do Mario sunglasses, so I'm all about Nintendo. Um, but yeah, that was the last movie, and I and I liked it. But I really, I unfortunately don't really have time to watch movies, and I'm, I'd love to watch more of them, to be frankly. It, it, don't worry about it. It's the same with me. Mine was Ninja Turtles, the the new one. That it's it's amazing. It's so good. And again, I want to see it actually. It's so good. The commentary. There's a lot of adult commentary mm -hmm. in there for you, so it's mm -hmm. good. Um, so as, as a parent, yeah, yeah. I, I get it. I appreciate the the kids movies with the adult commentary that they're not going to get, but we get. Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, it could be the last book that you read or maybe a book that you continue to go back to and is kind of your, you know, your go to what's, you know, either a favorite book or the last book that you read. A favorite book um, that I've read in, a, in recently or recently enough, and I've read it multiple times now, or actually I don't really didn't read it. I listened to it on, on, on whatever the, the you know, <laughs> oh, books. Yes. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for, thank you for saying that. Cause I'm the same way. I always say I read it and I'm like, I listened to it on audible. <laughs> yeah, it's audible. It wasn't, it wasn't reading, but it, it's a psychology. <laughs> it's called the psychology of money by Morgan Housel. And okay. it, it, it is very, I love that book because, you know, a lot of people, it's really just, super interesting uh, a couple tidbits from it like you know he basically talks about how like everything negative is you know everybody wants everything negative sounds smart you know like you're asking me like how does 24 sound well i could tell you like 24 sounds like a disaster blah blah, blah. but it just negative things sound smarter so people believe them but it doesn't mean they're actually true you know and and there's a lot of things there's a lot of things 
like that in that book, which I really like, but really what it does, it kind of gives you this mindset of like, what are you really shooting for financially in your life? You know, are you really like a lot of people just go, I want to be, I want to just have so much money, but what does that so much mean to you? You know, and where do you stop and where do you realize money is just freedom? It's not, you you know, like that's, that's the point. And I think that book to me was incredible. So psychology of money by Morgan Housel. It was, it's really, in my opinion, it's a great book. Okay. That's a great one. I have not heard of it and I haven't read it and I'm adding it to my audible list now. I love it. Love, love it. <laughs> so tell us um, if there's one person out there that you feel is, you know, quote unquote, winning at life right now that you <laughs> would love to be able to sit down, take to lunch, who would that be? Uh, Taylor Swift. <laughs> answer we've had on the podcast right now 100 i mean she she is she's winning in life she's she's dating travis kelsey so that's that's why she's living winning in life i mean uh, i don't no. disagree with you on that one from a woman's perspective yes yes i'm just i'm kidding but i mean just in general the girl's brilliant i mean she just had the best tour in the history of all tours uh, my wife and my daughter went to it and uh, i think that's my daughter's college tuition right there gone um, but, uh, I mean, it's incredible what she has done and what she's constantly doing. And, and I mean, I don't, you know, being in the spotlight so much and still being able to do all these things and live and somewhat live her life. Um, it's pretty imp- incredible. The girls or the yeah. woman's amazing. I keep on saying girl, which is not true. You know, the woman's amazing. So yeah, yes, yeah. she, I'd really, I'd love to pick her brain. Honestly. Yes. Yes. I, I think that is the most brilliant answer I have heard. <laughs> And I love um, coming from a man that, you know, Taylor Swift is your answer. I love that. So, all right, <laughs> last question, because um, that was just sure. too good. We should have ended there. But last, mm. last question, if you could go back and tell your, you know, 17, 18 teenage self um, something, one thing, one piece of advice, what would it be? I know it's a buy apples one. buy buy apple stock right now. <laughs> <And a lot laughs> <of it. laughs> Any amount you have, buy apple. That's it. Buy um, apple stock and be an early yeah. adopter into Bitcoin and then get out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, obviously, like hindsight's twenty twenty, but there's you learn. I mean, I I, I didn't go to college. You know, um, I kind of started uh, iced out gear right in high school, or I started going to college, but that didn't work out very well because I was working too much. Um, but it was, it was, you know, there's, there's a lot you, I learned, I basically got an MBA in real life, you know, that's mm. basically what happened. So, I mean, there's a lot I could tell myself, but, you know, maybe not, even not buying a house. I wish I never bought my house when I was 22 years old and, and okay. rented and, and use that money for something else like investing. That's a much different, I know that's not a very popular idea with tax savings mm. and everything else, but, but in reality, it's like, you know, there were a lot better options to buying things in the Valley at the time. And, and, you know, there's a lot, there's, there's a lot. So, um, no, I I think, uh, with the housing comment, you're speaking to Gen Z right now, you know, it's all the research Mm -hmm. shows they're, they're buying less. So I don't, I don't think that's an unusual comment. I love, um, I love all the comments. This has just been so fun. So many good, um, little nuggets of wisdom and, you know, such a, such a great career. So, Thank you for being open and honest and willing to share your story with us. Cause I do think that, you know, there's somebody out there that, that needs to hear this and, you know, we appreciate you at ASD. So we look forward to seeing you in March. Can't wait. And thank you for having me on. I really very much appreciate it. All right, David. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Be sure to subscribe to ASD Market Week's Let's Talk a Little Shop, a podcast that can be found on iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, or Spotify. See you there.